Good evening. I'd like to call our regular council meeting for Monday, March the 22nd to order. Hello and welcome to members of the public who are watching our live web stream this evening or tuning in to watch the recording at another time. I'm Merrick McNeil-Smith and joining me in the council chamber is Councillor Garnett and our five councillor colleagues are joining us via Zoom. You should see them on your screen. Good evening to uh, Councillor Duncan, Councillor Fallett, Councillor O'Keefe, Councillor Rintoul and Councillor Wainwright. I'd like to uh, begin with a, a respectful uh, territorial acknowledgement uh, that we are holding this evening's meeting in the territory of the Wasanich Nation. And uh, before looking for approval of the agenda, there is one addition and uh, Councillor Garnett would like to provide an, up uh, an update on her councillor's report on the Sydney Museum. And with that, I look for a motion. Move the agenda as, as amended. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? None opposed, that carries, thank you. And we'll turn to our public participation. Uh, we have no uh, uh, members of the public to speak before council this evening, but we do have two uh, written submissions, which I'll now turn to Mr. Humble to, uh, to read aloud. Mr. Humble. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so the first uh, piece of correspondence, correspondence is from Mona Brash, who resides at 965 2nd Street. Dear Mayor and Council, as a resident who frequently enjoys sitting on the curved wooden benches on the east side of the Pier Hotel at Beacon Park, I have noticed something over the years. These lovely benches and the ones along, alongside the Sydney Waterfront Walkway, enjoyed by m many, face the ocean and Mount Baker. More and more people are coming to the park, especially on the weekends, but it is rare to see anyone who is accompanying young children sitting on these benches. Very young children love to sing and dance in the bandstand, run on the grass, and scamper up and down the little hill in front of the Shaw Discovery Center. Their joy at being free to have such open space is wonderful to watch and hear. However, the adults accompanying young children cannot enjoy the benches facing the ocean, and sit down because they must be between the little children and the Sydney waterfront walkway. They do this to place themselves between the children and the walkway with its rock face and the ocean. So the adults end up having to stand between the children and the path. It would be very thoughtful for the town to install alongside the walkway at least two benches facing the hotel. This would allow all those adults who accompany young children to sit and enjoy their visit to the waterfront. With our population growing and Sydney becoming more of a destination for local people, the park should be more welcoming to all people. This would be in keeping with the 2018 Parks Master Plan in many ways. One of these is to have additional seating at Beacon Park. Uh, thank you, Mr. Humble, and thanks to Mona Brash for your, uh, for your input and, and your observations. Uh, and with there being a request uh, with regardings to such benches, uh, I would turn to staff if they would like to... Um, to provide a comment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll defer to um, to uh, the Director of Engineering, Ms. Clary. Good evening, Ms. Clary. Good evening, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, so the town has been putting out the, the movable um, plastic chairs for the past few years in Beacon Park, and the intent is to continue with those um, plastic movable chairs uh, post-COVID. We did not put them out in 2020 just because um, people would be picking them up and moving them with their hands. So it could be a, a, a way to spread COVID-19. Um, however, potentially this summer, if, uh, if concerns have decreased enough and, and future summers, that would be um, staff's intent. We could look at benches. However, uh, Beacon Park does have irrigation. So there's some complication in that, um, but we, I do think that the, the movable chairs would meet this person's um, request. Thank you, Ms. Clary. And uh, I'll turn back to Mr. Humble uh, for the second um, submission. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this submission is from uh, Teresa Preston and Gord McIntyre, and they reside at 2359 Brether Avenue. Dear Mayor McNeil-Smith and Council, RE Tree Permit Application 2359 Brether Avenue. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you and the community our tree permit application. In addition, we wish to thank Jen Clary and the Parks Department for guiding us in this process, forwarding the failed 2018 application <clears throat> for our review, uh, visiting the property and speaking with us. We are aware Council is familiar with our tree. 
We summarize below the areas we consider most significant as you consider the application to remove this beautiful old dying arbutus tree. As required, we obtained an independent arborist report. Scott Mitchell of Scotty Tree and Arborist Service reports deterioration of one of the remaining three stems. In addition, the report discusses the numerous signs, uh, numerous, the numerous signs confirming this tree is dying. Small and medium branch shedding, tree wounds, and most significantly, root plate rot. The report concludes that, uh, open quotation, the arbutus tree is well into its decline. Failure of this whole tree is very probable. I recommend the uh, removal of the entire tree, close quotation. We understand why our tree is protected. However, our tree is dying and appears to have deteriorated since the 2018 mitigation of flexible cables. The current state of the tree continues to put our home and our neighbor's home at risk. The tree also th threatens electrical and telephone infrastructure. These are replaceable. Our deepest concern is human damage. With every wind warning or storm, we live in fear. Our neighbours have expressed the same concern. We would believe that Town Council values our lives at least as much as a protected tree. We recognise that unprotected trees have stem failure and eventually root plate rot. However, owners have the power to mitigate threats and remove dying trees. This application process has made it clear to us that we have no rights as property owners to protect ourselves and others from this tree. We are at the mercy of Town Council. <coughs> With no decision-making power, our conclusion is that this tree actually belongs to the Town of Sydney. We understand that the, t that the Town Council and staff are taking responsibility for decisions around the maintenance and demise of this tree, and we bear the cost. Should Town Council once again deny the application to remove the Arbutus tree, we will wait for further guidance from the Parks Department. In addition, we wish to be on record that we consider the Town of Sydney completely liable for any resulting damage to property and life. We will apprise our insurance providers of this. Thank you, Mr. Humble, and, and thanks to Gordon and Terry McIntyre for your submission this evening. We will certainly consider those, um, those comments uh, when we are deliberating on the item later in the agenda. With that, I'll bring public participation to a close. And uh, next, we move to, ad to adoption of our minutes from our regular council meeting of March the 8th. Move adoption. Second. Any errors, or omissions, or comments? All in favor? None opposed. Motion carries. Thank you. I'll turn next to my mayor's report, and I'll be fairly brief this evening. Uh, you will see appended in the uh, agenda the uh, CRD board highlights from our board meeting of March the 10th, uh, as well as all background information, uh, which is uh, you can access via links to, uh, to the CRD website. There was just one item that I wanted to comment on this evening, and that was the Saanich Peninsula Waterways Environmental Action Service, and um, the board was pleased to uh, to pass uh, or adopt uh, a final bylaw to establish a waterways and water bodies monitoring and coordination service on the Sandwich Peninsula, and I think this is uh, an excellent example of the three municipalities working in common interest and working together collaboratively uh, with the establishment of this uh, bylaw through CRD. Uh, we know um, earlier in our term. Uh, community organized or residents uh, uh, groups approached us with uh, N North Saanich uh, with concerns in CM Harbour. Uh, likewise, Central Saanich has had concerns uh, in some of their uh, harbours, and so I think this is uh, a, a good opportunity to uh, to work together to uh, to try and address those concerns from uh, members of the public. Second item I want to touch on is uh, Mayor, uh, North Saanich Mayor Jeff Orr and myself were pleased to meet with the new Executive Director of the Saanich Peninsula Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Al Smith uh, wasn't born in, in, uh, in the area but uh, raised at a very young age uh, and educated and uh, uh, has excellent uh, business experience, uh, success in a variety of businesses uh, on the peninsula and in Victoria. And uh, we look forward to, the, uh, to his experience in business and enthusiasm uh, that he brings to the uh, to the chamber. Lastly, I'll just touch on uh, on an uh, event I attend, a Zoom event I attended today, and I don't want to steal uh, Councillor Garnett's thunder uh, with regards to the museum. But I was pleased to make remarks on behalf of uh, council and staff and and the town for the um, uh, for the tremendous uh, career that uh, Peter Garnham, executive director of the uh, um, Sydney Museum and Archives, has had for more than 25 years, and. Um, I'll leave uh, Councillor Garnett to speak of uh, something unique that happened at today's meeting. With that, I'll turn to uh, our first Councillor report and turn to Councillor O'Keefe. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So just reporting out on uh, my attendance at the four day BC EDA conference that uh, took place uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, completely online with the theme being economic revival after the pandemic. Uh, I reduced 50 pages of notes to five pages. I'm not going to go through all of it, so not to worry, but just a, th a couple, a few things that I'll point out uh, that I thought may be of interest. Um, I think what's interesting when you look at the experience of other communities, you can look at this and say, huh, we did a lot of the same things that they did. So it's interesting to see how I think, how we aligned with what other communities in BC were, were doing. And then there's some differences as well. So I think it's interesting for business community and business organizations and the town to, to take a look at those and uh, to look for other ideas that we might want to adopt. Um, there was a number of good speakers. One uh, couple of note, uh, there's one about the love of cities and just basically talking about how towns often uh, pay a lot of attention to, to physical infrastructure, but encouraging us, especially in this times of a pandemic to think of uh, what they, they called uh, emotional infrastructure or building a, safe, a sense of place and uh, taking taking uh, actions and doing things to encourage people to be able to get outside and also to connect with each other. And uh, dog parks were mentioned as one of the best ways to, to invest in that, uh, to be an icebreaker and to allow people to connect. Um, another speaker talked about uh, saving your town and her focus was on uh, mainly small towns and small businesses that suffered during the pandemic, just not from the, the normal aspects of the pandemic, but also the, the trend towards online shopping that uh, escalated during the pandemic. So a number of things pointed out there about uh, doing new ways of businesses, uh, doing new ways of business, uh, helping to build community and some tips on uh, how to beat the online competition. Um, there's also a couple of speakers who were talking about attracting new business. I think one of the biggest takeaways from that was in terms of the importance of our website and the importance of um, having information on there that is um, update relevant for people who are looking to, to do business in, in our community. Um, last thing I'll touch on is just something, uh, a presentation that there was on the Indigenous economy and just about the increasing trend in Indigenous entrepreneurs uh, thinking about what communities can do to encourage entrepreneurship for those uh, Indigenous peoples. Um, and also that there's a huge untapped Indigenous workforce that can help deal with some of the work shortages that many businesses are experiencing. And also pointing out that um, supporting the Indigenous economy acts as a platform for reconciliation and uh, mentioning that municipalities can play a role in building relationships with our local First Nations and that can open the door to other opportunities that can be mutually beneficial. Um, I'll leave it at that. I think there's some good tips and info in the, in the five pages. I'll be sharing that with the chamber who I'm a liaison to. Um, I don't know whether the SBIA or other business groups would be interested, but it'll it's part of our, our minute, so it's available there for people who uh, have an interest. And um, I'll leave it at that, unless anybody has questions. Uh, thank you, Councillor O'Keefe. Um, I understand um, the business development manager at the BIA was in attendance as well? I think she... I believe she was. Yeah. I don't know whether we all attended the same sessions or not. Well, we certainly thank you for uh, for the commitment to attend over a number of days and uh, uh, taking those notes and, and giving a fulsome report, uh, written report for uh, for council and the public to um, to view. Uh, any questions from uh, colleagues? Thank you again, Councillor Keefe. I'll turn to Councillor Garnett. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just an update from the Sydney Museum and Archives Society. 
um, attended it at the annual general meeting on March 20th, and this will be a brief update with something special at the end. <laughs> From a financial perspective, the museum performed well in 2020, receiving over $60,000 in grants and special programming, which is a great achievement. They ended the year with a surplus of over $45,000. The surplus was primarily a result of the funding provided by Sydney North Saanich for the third employed position, uh, which took some time to fill. The surplus has been transferred to reserve to cover any unforeseen issues that m may occur in 2022 and hopefully nothing like what we faced last year. As council might remember, I had mentioned that the museum was in need of more people to come forward for their board of directors and I'm pleased to announce that the positions have all been filled. The three individuals added were Mr. Ray Conrath, who was an incumbent, Mr. Peter Garnum, who's now transitioned into the board of directors from being an employee, and Mr. Wayne Leach. Uh, thank you for everybody stepping forward to fill those positions. Following the AGM, the first meeting of the Board of Directors was held and the following appointments were made. Mr. Richard Novak will continue on as chair. Mr. Bob Jones will continue on as um, vice chair. Mr. Daryl Cousins will continue on as secretary. And new to treasurer position is Ms. Shannon Neustadter. Uh, for 2022, there have already been successful grant, grant applications. The Heritage Grant they, they were successful in receiving will allow for the floor re refurbishment to take place but will mean that the museum will be closed for three months from June 1st to August 31st. One of the important improvements, and my fellow councillors will be happy here, this will be that this will lead to for the museum to be more accessible as the current flooring causes problems for individuals' mobility issues because the carpet bunches up in many of the places. So that's a great thing. Uh, staff are hoping the work will be done a little bit earlier and there will be access to the upper floor as the ne next exhibit is set to begin in September. And the first exhibit in September is, this is a bit of a tongue twister, Icelandic Connections exhibit, which features the Articulation Textile Art Group. Okay. Uh, one other thing, the museum was informed uh, that last week that the UVic co-op program will provide funding for a summer student. So that's another uh, positive for the museum. Um, and the final thing I want to mention is uh, something that uh, the mayor had alluded to earlier. Is, uh, I also attended this afternoon. and. Um, it was a celebration of the culmination of Peter Garnum's career over 25 years at the museum. Um, they've renamed the bottom floor of the Peter Garnum Gallery. Uh, there's a lovely plaque that's been put in his honor. Uh, he was quite surprised, and this is uh, to Councillor O'Keefe when you were asking me if they were doing anything for him. I couldn't say anything. I was sworn to secrecy, so <laughs> it was. So this is why. So, anyways, he was very surprised. He was very appreciative, and uh, it was it was a great event. Um, uh, our MP, Elizabeth uh, May, actually spoke uh, from Ottawa, <laughs> from Parliament. Uh, and there was a spokesperson for Adam Olson's office as well. So um, uh, just a, a, a fabulous thing to honor somebody who's contributed so much to the community and um, will continue to do as he's, he's now on the board of directors and has gone right into being on a committee to, to, for the, for the, to, to get the building ready for the f floor refurbishment. So um, uh, uh, he's just another example of one of the great residents we have in our community and how they offer their services uh, to make us a better place. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Garnett, for that uh, very positive update. I'll now turn to uh, the first of our committee reports and I'll turn to Councillor O'Keefe uh, with regards to the minutes from the January 27th and February 17th emergency planning committee meetings. I'll move adoption of both sets of minutes. Second. Seconded. Uh, any discussion, Councillor O'Keefe? Uh, sure. I'll just uh, mention a, a couple highlights. First of all, I think um, I would encourage residents to, to read fully these minutes as they come out. Um, in the past, uh, we sometimes only got them on a quarterly basis, but now there's monthly meetings. And there's some good info and insight in, in these minutes about uh, what town staff are doing to keep us uh, safe. Um, a couple of things that I thought might be interest of residents is that um, all residents in our local seniors facilities who wanted to be vaccinated have now been vaccinated. And I believe more than 80% of the staff working there as well. Um, also wanted to remind residents about the new emergency management notification system. Um, this is a new system called Saanich Peninsula Alert that we're transitioning to as of Thursday. And people who uh, want to subscribe, uh, there's a link on the town's website. Uh, even if you were subscribing to the previous system, you have to go and resubscribe again. 
Um, one of the features they wanted to highlight from this is that the new system divides the peninsula into different zones. So you can sign up to get alerts for your own area or from other areas as well. So for example, you live in Sydney, but you work in North or Central Saanich, you can sign up for alerts for both areas. Um, also people who don't live on the peninsula, but work here, maybe they're from uh, Victoria or the, the uh, West Shore, or they have a family member in Sydney can also sign up for the alerts as well. And uh, yeah, that's it, unless anybody has questions. Appreciate that. Uh, any questions from colleagues? Seeing none, I'll call a question. All in favor? And none opposed, the motion carries. Thank you. And I'll turn to Councillor Wainwright for the uh, minutes of the Economic Advisory Committee meeting on March 11th. I'll move receipt of the minutes. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? None opposed, motion carries, thank you. And I'll turn to Councillor Wainwright again, who is chair of our committee of the whole meeting last week for the minutes and recommendations. Councillor Wainwright. I'll move receipt of the minutes. Second. Second. Discussion, uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thanks. So um, in regards to, um, actually we're going to, we're gonna get into the resolution separately, is that correct? They will be moved individually, yes. Yeah, Councilor. okay, so yeah, I'll just save that for now, thanks. Sorry yeah. about that. All in favor of receiving the minutes? None opposed, motion carries. Okay, the first uh, uh, item is with respect to development permit application number DP100819. This is 10478 and 10482 Rest Haven Drive. Was recommended by committee and I so move that development permit application be forwarded to the APC for further review and comment. Second. Uh, discussion? Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you. Um, I was reflecting on comments made by my colleagues um, in our discussion on this at committee, the whole, uh, especially in regards to the fact that the adaptable units have stairs up to, um, the, they can enter through the front door. However, to access their own front patio, they would have to take an elevator down to their car, carport, roll themselves out of the garage around the house to get to their patio on the, in, in the front. And, you know, as I, in, in the last 18 months, I've sat in a, a number of work, shops and townhouses in regards to accessibility issues. And the thing I heard over and over again is that persons with disabilities are, are tired of having to, uh, to take alternate entrances to stores and public buildings. Uh, some cases in older buildings, I understand that it's hard and it's difficult to retrofit. However, when we're looking at brand new buildings, it seems to me that um, developers of these buildings, when they're building a unit for accessible, a person with accessibility issues, they should be planning, anticipating, and designing these accordingly. So to me, it's just not acceptable that a person with an accessibility issue would have to engage in such a convoluted process to access their own front patio. Um, I'm okay with this going to APC for now. I'd be interested to hear their comments on this, but it's something that in the future, I don't think I'll, uh, I'll be able to support. That's all for now, thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call a question all in favor. None opposed, the motion carries. Thank you, Councillor Wainwright. Okay, the uh, next item is uh, development variance permit application number DV100299. This is 10364 All Bay Road. And it was uh, recommended by committee and I so move that owners and tenants and occupation of property within 75 meters, that's 246 feet of 10364 All Bay Road be notified regarding development variance application number DV100299 and that any written correspondence received be forwarded to council at the time of consideration of approval of the variance. Second. 
Uh, discussion? Uh, I'll call the question. All in favor? None opposed. The motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next item is with respect to a public art proposal for a wall mural at 2437 Beacon Avenue. It was recommended by committee and I so moved that the request from the Sydney Business Improvement Area Society to install a mural on the west face of the building at 2437 Beacon Avenue be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that a letter of understanding be established between the town and the SBIA addressing items related to maintenance of the public art and assurance that the town will not be held liable for any potential damage, including vandalism, to the public art. Two, that no costs are to be incurred by the town. And three, that any future installation at this location be brought forward to council as per the town's public art policy. Second. Uh, discussion. Okay, I'll start a speaker's list. I have, uh, did you wish to, um, as a mover, wish to speak, uh, Councillor Wainwright? Uh, no, Just thanks. Okay, so I'll go get with Councillor O'Keefe, uh, Councillor Fallot, then Councillor Garnet. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as mentioned, the last Committee of the Whole, I had some concerns about this mural, and, and I still do. Um, that was reinforced by a, a letter that we, we got from a member of the public. Um, so my concerns are uh, still that the mural does not uh, reflect Sydney's unique character or history. Um, I found it, it looks generic. It looks like something that was drafted quickly and uh, by someone perhaps who hasn't visited here. I, I know they're not from here, they're from Vancouver. So maybe uh, they don't understand our character. Um, in addition, as pointed out by one of our citizens that wrote in, um, the phrase on the mural, see you in Sydney by the sea, it just doesn't make any sense. If, if this was going to be an advertisement in another town like Vancouver or uh, some place to encourage people to come, it would make more sense. But for the residents or people who are here already, it doesn't make much sense. Um, the other thing I'll reiterate again is that we're not using local artists. Um, to me, it's ironic that there has been so much focus on supporting local businesses and many communities uh, recognize the importance of supporting the local arts community. Um, but this is an artist from Vancouver who's, who has been hired to do the mural. And I know there's lots of talented people in our area. I'd like to see uh, local artists being provided this opportunity. I understand the SBIA felt they were wanting to get this done quickly. Mm -hmm. However, uh, it's not clear to me what, what the urgency is. So uh, I would suggest to the SBIA, if they want the community to support local businesses, that they should also be supporting local and invest a bit more time to do the right thing. Um, I noted that the SBIA recently came up with a new logo that I saw on their website. And I thought that was very attractive and uh, it reflects Sydney character. So I would, you know, urge them to, uh, to consider that and come up with something a bit more attractive for our town. That's all for me. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor O'Keefe. I'll turn to Councillor Fallot. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I echo Councillor O'Keefe's comments. Um, I, I felt that the phrase needs to be explained. Uh, see you see you soon in Sydney and that just really and truly doesn't make any sense and I understand uh, from what Ms. Shaw said um, to us last week when she explained about the timing and um, somebody who is prepared to do the job quickly and uh, to do this sort of work I get all of the rationale for that unfortunately we we have ended up with a product that doesn't reflect Sydney and um, is extremely generic and doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And I feel that that's really unfortunate. If we're going to go to this um, effort to create something like this and to, in essence, create a showstopper on a, on a great big wall that doesn't reflect what it is we want, it ends up looking like exactly what it is, that it was a job done quickly to feel, fit a specific need 
of speed um, where I don't understand what the urgency is for speed. So um, I, I'm really loath to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fallett. I'll turn to Councillor Garnett. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I have to be honest. Uh, Councillor O'Keefe made some good points, and when I left here last week, I I, I, I realized that yeah, it, it it didn't. Although I like the idea of bright colors and the popping of them to add some vibrancy to that wall, the whole idea of having something that represents Sydney was missing. And then, of course, the letter of correspondence came in from a member of the community, and and so it just sort of stuck home with me that yeah, you know, we we, we should be able to do better. Uh, I I do I do like the idea. The whole premise is a great one, but I some points that have been made by previous councillors are, are quite valid. Uh, for me, the, I think the whole the whole idea of providing what looks what looks and feels like Sydney needs to be incorporated in the art with the bright colours, in my opinion. But just just needs to be a little more and hits home and and gives people a I think will give the community a sense of pride, if you will, just to look at that and go, yeah, that represents who we are as a community. So. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Garnett. I'll turn to uh, Councillor uh, Rintoul. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and well, I certainly appreciate uh, the letter and the, the comments uh, from Mr. Blair and, and from my colleagues. Um, Mr. Blair had an interesting analogy in there to the former Soviet Union. <laughs> Having spent several years there, I, I, I don't necessarily share that view. It is very colorful. And uh, I think that was what um, the SBA, having taken this initiative, was aiming for, was to time this for spring. Um, we're not talking about a permanent installation. Um, my understanding, uh, the concept behind the uh, see you in Sydney uh, phrase was to encourage this to be somewhat of a photo wall, somewhere uh, you could you know, snap a, a selfie or, or a, a family uh, a photo uh, to put on one of your social media accounts and that the phrase see you in Sydney would would you know gain legs and and travel through the the magic of social media uh, that's what I understood the intent to be and um, in that it's not a permanent installation I'm, I'm comfortable continuing to support this SBIA initiative thank you Mr. Mayor uh, thank you Councillor Rintoul Councillor Councillor uh, Duncan Thank you. I, I agree with Councillor Intrul. It In the role of approving this as council, I see we're not spending town money on it. It's not being placed in a public park, um, like the, you know, the art walk. Um, the, the, the critiques of it are, are valid in terms of whether it's going to be great art or, or something that people understand the purpose of it, as, as Councillor Intrul explained, but um, that was for the board of the organization that is spending money on it to have sorted out before they came to us. And, and I feel like our decision on whether this can go up is, is whether it kind of meets the criteria of, you know, whether it was obstructing the sidewalk, whether it was in some way profane or detracting from the town and, and not to, to really critique it on its merits of, you know, if we we're, were the organization, we would have picked it. So I'm comfortable moving this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duncan. Uh, Councillor Wainwright. Uh, I'll just say that I uh, concur with uh, Councillor Duncan and Councillor Rintoul. Thank you, Councillor Winright. I'll um, uh, speak for a moment. I, um, I'll uh, agree with some of the comments uh, from uh, from Councillor Rintoul. I think uh, you know it was uh, it was very positive to have the presentation and see the uh, the initiative uh, that uh, the BIA. Uh, the business owner and the property owner were taking to to add something to our community um, though um, mr. Blair's uh, letter did give me pause to uh, to reconsider and I think uh, I think the points of uh, whether this is a short term uh, installation or a longer term installation I think um, reflecting the town's culture history and character is is important I think uh, local artists uh, we have lots on in Sydney and the peninsula um, and I think um, uh, I think it's uh, it, it should be reconsidered um, again if there was a sense of urgency and I realized the timing uh, by the parties involved was to uh, to have it up because we as we've experienced the weather today are uh, are starting spring and it would be nice to see that uh, that theme up as soon as possible but uh, I think a pause uh, to uh, to reflect uh, on improving that um, 
that town's culture, history, and character would be uh, would be appropriate. And so I won't support uh, this motion, but I would certainly hope uh, council could come to a consensus on a way to uh, to move this forward uh, in the short term. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed? We have four opposed, Councillor O'Keefe, Councillor Fallett, Councillor Garnett, and myself. The motion is defeated. <coughs> Do Council um, have a, another motion to consider? I can move on to the next item. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I take the that next as a item no. is proposed amendments to the council procedure bylaw and it was uh, recommended by committee and I so move that the proposed amendments to the council procedure bylaw be referred to a working group of council consisting of the mayor, Councillor Wainwright and Councillor O'Keefe to review the proposed amendments and bring them forward to a future committee of the whole meeting. <clears throat> Second. I would like to uh, just comment. It was my intention, and it only came out, I think, in the discussion, not in the motion itself, that the intention was to have the working group consisting of the three identified in the motion, but also to include the CAO and the uh, corporate clerk, uh, corporate officer. So if I could have uh, suggest an amendment to include those in the working group. Uh, I'll include that as an amendment. Thank you. Seconded. Seconded. Call a question on the amendment. All in favor? Uh, any discussion on the main motion? All in favor? None opposed. That motion carries. And Councillor Wainwright, uh, please continue. Okay, um, moving on. Uh, committee considered the 2021 grants and aid. And uh, I'll start out with uh, uh, the recommendation committee made that, uh, and I so move that the following 2021 grant and aid requests be approved for funding from the COVID 19 Safe Restart Funds. Saanich Marine Rescue Society, 5,000. Vancouver Island South Film and Media Commission, 2,000. Cycling Without Age Society, 2,000. Kids Sport Greater Victoria, 3,000. Crisis Intervention and Public Information Society, 700. Farmlands Trust Greater Victoria Society, 5,000. Sydney Lawn Bowling, 3,000. Uh, FED Urban Agricultural Society, 1,000. Sydney Lions Food Bank, 5,000 for a total of 26,700. Do we have a seconder? Second. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call a question. All in favor? None opposed. That motion carries. Council Wainwright. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, in the next block, there are two items where uh, members of council uh, recuse themselves from the discussion. So the first one that I would deal with is the Sydney and Peninsula Literary Society. Uh, thank you, Councillor Wainwright. I have a, a conflict. Uh, my business uh, does have a relationship with that society, so I will now recuse myself and ask Councillor Wainwright to continue chairing. And I'll just wait for the mayor to leave the chambers. And then it's a little unusual for the chair to actually make a motion, but procedure allows it. So um, committee recommended, and I so move, that the Sydney and Peninsula Literary Society be uh, approved for 500 from grants and aid. Second. second. Okay, that's seconded. Is there any discussion? Call the question. All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Uh, can we bring the mayor back, please? And while we're at it, I would uh, we'd then be moving on to the Sydney Guide and Scout Hall Society. And uh, Councillor Duncan, I'll need to recuse myself. Do it need to be put in a room, or do you want to just me to turn everything off for this? <laughs> I think staff is, me the whole. I think staff's going to move you to the right. uh, waiting room. Yes. And uh, Mayor McNeil Smith, I'll pass the gavel back to you. Yes, sorry, do we have it? Uh, so Councillor uh, Duncan has recused herself from the meeting and uh, do we have a motion? Uh, it was recommended by committee and I so move that the Sydney Gu Guide and Scout Hall Society uh, 
uh, be approved for a thousand in funding from grants and aid. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? None opposed. Motion carries. If we could please reconnect, Councillor Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Humble. Okay. You can and hear us okay, Councillor Duncan. Thank you, uh, Councillor Wainwright. Okay, and it was recommended by committee, and I so move the uh, remaining uh, uh, grant and aids. Uh, so, Bike Victoria 1300, uh, Peninsula Stream Society for Core Operations 5000, 676 Kitty Hawk Sponsoring Committee Society 750, Navy League of Canada 750, Peninsula Dry Grad Society 1000, all approved for funding out of the general grants and aid funds. Second. We have it seconded. Any discussion? Call a question all in favor. Not opposed. Motion carries. Uh, thank you, Councillor Wainwright, for taking us through those uh, recommendations. We'll now turn to uh, staff reports. And item 13A is a tree removal application for an arbut arbutus tree at 2359 Brether Avenue. And a report uh, dated March 2nd. I'll turn to staff for an introduction. Please. Thank you, Mayor. So this uh, this tree did come before this council in 2018 when uh, the, the former property owner was requesting to have it removed. At the time, um, council voted to deny the request to remove the tree um, and the, the property owner um, installed some cabling to uh, some tension cabling to um, prevent major failure of the limbs, the larger limbs of the tree. The property then sold and now this is the new property owner requesting to remove the tree again. Um, as mentioned in their letter, they had been uh, shared the, the previous history of the tree um, when they submitted their application and uh, uh, we uh, met with them on site to review the tree. Um, it's staff's opinion that the tree isn't an imminent hazard, although it does, it is declining. Um, there is a, a large stem that has um, died since since the decision was made in 2018 um, that limb could be removed while keeping the cable bracing intact um, and uh, our, the town's arborist can meet with the, the property owner um, if uh, and, and describe how to do that if uh, if council um, proceeds to deny this tree removal request um, additional pruning will also likely be required um, if this is uh, denied I'll turn to, uh, thank you, Ms. Clary. I'll turn to Council Wainwright if you have a question or. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And this is actually a question. Um, the situation with this tree, uh, you know, staff uh, understand that the tree is in decline and they're anticipating that there's going to be a need for pruning uh, over time. And at some point, um, the tree will be sufficiently uh, uh, it, you know, deteriorated that it will be removed. So we're looking at a at a scenario where we expect to see a series of if we deny the application or approve now, we're expecting that the property owner is going to have to follow up with a series of applications over the next I don't know five or so you know or more years uh, for work on the tree, and it, it you know while I appreciate that um, the, the tree is of benefit to the town and we may in fact want to have it, you know, stay as long as possible. Um, it, it seems a bit over the top to make the property owner uh, pay for the permit applications every time when we know that the, that the situation is gonna play out like this. So I'm wondering um, if, uh, council does decide to deny the application, whether it's possible for us to waive uh, future permit fees with respect to this tree um, for the next, say, 10 years or so, uh, just to try to be fair to the property owner? Thank you. Ms. Clary, or our turn to staff. Um, I, I may need to uh, ask Mr. Humble or uh, um, yeah, I can, um, the procedure of this, but our bylaw doesn't really, sorry. If it's, if it's um, the only, um, I guess, issue or 
potential issue with that is if the fees are established by bylaw under the under uh, under a bylaw um, there's not really a other than amending the bylaw there's not an opportunity for council to waive uh, waive the uh, requirements of the bylaw a sub I have a follow-up question through to staff would um, so it doesn't sound like there's a mechanism by resolution tonight for the future but if the property owner was to submit a future application could council waive the application fee at that time when the application was actually made <clears throat> again um, uh, from my perspective um, and I see Andrew has his hand up so maybe he has a different perspective but uh, again if it's uh, if the fees are established by bylaw I don't believe so but uh, Andrew, I don't know if you have a different response. If it's the will of council, the bylaw can certainly be amended to make that happen. But is there an amendment required for a one-time waiving of fees? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay, thank you. Uh, council Wainwright, did you wish to follow up? That answered my immediate question. Um, I'm happy to see what my colleagues think about this and weigh in as the discussion proceeds. Thanks, Councillor Wainwright. Um, any further discussion? I'll turn to Councillor Wintoul, then Councillor Fallot. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, turning back to the uh, um, public participation period earlier, and a, a letter was read from this applicant and, and that query with regard to um, uh, liability uh, came up and so if I could through to staff uh, do we know if there's a precedent in the province uh, where a municipality has been found liable or or partly liable for a tree or limb falling on a structure after a declining tree removal application was denied on private property so I'm trying to get a feel for whether or not uh, we know um, provincially if if there's any sort of case law with respect to the scenario that's suggested in the letter from the applicants. Thank you, Councillor. I'll turn to staff. Uh, Ms. Clary? Uh, through the Mayor to uh, Councillor Rintoul, we're not aware of any such case at this time. Thank you. Um, I, sorry, I, I can add that our bylaw does allow property owners to remove trees if they are uh, imminent hazards. Um, if there is a windstorm and the tree appears to be uprooting or, or some major thing is happening, the bylaw does allow um, emergency removals. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Antoul. Uh, Councillor Fellow. Oh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm prepared to make a motion, but I'm not going to make the recommended motion from staff. And I will make the motion that the application to remove the Arbutus tree at 2359 Brether Avenue be approved. Um, and if that's seconded, I'll speak to it. Second. Do we have it seconded? I'll turn to uh, Councillor Fellow. Did you wish to speak, Councillor Fellow? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I've watched that tree over the years, and, and it's, it's an, a, an amazing specimen of an arbutus tree. And um, I lived for many years on Salt Spring and, and was privileged to be, to see those trees and, and also be annoyed by them because they shed their leaves in the summertime and uh, <laughs> all of the stuff that goes with it. But arbutus is a very dense wood, and it's a very heavy wood. and when i looked at that tree uh just the other day i went past it on friday to look at it again and i do have a serious concern with that tree in the setting if this were on a large property i wouldn't hesitate uh, for a moment to say you know we'll just let this tree be and live its life however it's going to but i am not prepared to um I'm not prepared to leave that tree in existence knowing what is happening to the tree. Um, for me, I feel that there is reasonable grounds to approve taking that tree down, even though it is a protected tree, even though it is a magnificent tree, and even though it may live another five to ten years without issue 
I think it's a matter of time, and I'm not prepared to to put those homeowners and um, the neighborhood through should there be failure that causes an inconvenience, uh, let alone harm and damage. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Fellow. I'll turn to the seconder, uh, Councillor Garnett. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, I can I concur on many of the points that Councillor Fallett um, has raised. And back in 2018, I, I voted in favor of removal of the tree. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to get a view of the tree, not, not going on the property, but was able to get a view of the tree from one of the neighbors' perspectives. I was invited to come in the house and be able to see it from their perspective. And I could understand there was a reasonable amount of fear at the time. And the tree has degraded quite a bit since then in my last visit that I went out there on Friday as well when Barbara went and uh, it uh, it's worrisome um, I've seen the cabling up top and um, I'm not sure exactly which limb it is that's being referred to that's um, that's uh, dying but I, I did a bit of research on the tree itself and the mention of the, the root um, rot in the plate uh, is very concerning because you know it's a situation where the, these people are rightfully afraid I think and when the tree is going to decide it's going to go over they may not have any warning and uh, given the veracity of the windstorms we've been facing lately and how often they've been coming it seems to be something in climate change that we're experiencing more and more uh, strong wind windstorms are hitting us and this particular tree I'm not sure if it's going to be able to last five or ten years I'm not an expert but um, I probably put myself in their place and how I would feel if I was in their home living with that potentiality and what has already occurred in terms of limbs uh, falling and I, I would be concerned and I would probably be asking for the same thing. So that's where I stand. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Garnett. Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you. I, I think like most of my colleagues, we're generally in favor of keeping trees as long as we can in our, our community, as long as there's no imminent hazard to people or property. Um, when we looked at the tree on All Bay last week, or recently anyways, um, the arborist report that the individual commissioned for that indicated that the tree was still generally healthy and posed no imminent threat. And so although there was a fear by the homeowner of, of that tree coming down, it seemed from what their own arborist said that there wasn't that imminent concern. Um, so what's different for me in this case is that um, the arborist report cited many examples of how the tree is decaying. Um, it indicated that it's highly probable that there will be a failure of a ma major portion of the tree. Um, I appreciate staff's concern that you know, there's no telling when that failure might be. Um, I don't know where the five to 10 years came from, but there's, you know, it seems to me that uh, it, it could happen at any time. And so when I think about that um, and other things that are mentioned in the Arborist report and noting in what close proximity it is to sidewalks when people are walking by, uh, to power lines and other homes. Um, so. I, I think the risk and consequence of damage is high. So I have to agree with um, uh, Councillor Fallett and Garnett that I, unfortunately, I think it, uh, it needs to come down. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, Councillor Duncan. Thank you. And I think just I, I'm in agreement with with what Councillor O'Keefe has said about what was different about this tree application. And I guess just to add to that, that I feel um, in previous cases, there's there's been some mitigation that was able to be recommended that they could continue to try. Whereas in this case, the mitigation you know, back in 2018, when we saw this, we let it go because there was a mitigation that was suggested that was tried and it, it doesn't seem to have removed some of the problem is still dropping very large limbs. Um, there's one new significant death of a limb here and, and that mitigation isn't going to help. And I know that if we continue pruning this tree, it will probably only accelerate the dieback. I, I don't see how this tree would make it much longer, um, especially knowing there's a, a beautiful tree that's across the street from me and, and it went 
in under 10 years for sure from, from a much healthier state than this one was in last time we saw this application. So uh, I'm in favor of, of getting it over quickly um, because they would be back, I think, every year saying, is it damaged enough yet? Is it damaged enough yet? Is it damaged enough yet? If it hadn't fallen down yet. So um, this this one is, we'll, we'll take the tree off palliative care and, and let it let it go quickly. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Duncan. Further speakers? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? We have none opposed. Uh, the motion carries. Thank you. We'll next turn to item 13B, a staff report on the proposed memorandum of understanding to find a business development, sorry, to fund a business development manager term position or report. Uh, Mr. Humble. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so the focus of this report is to follow up on uh, Council's resolution of March 2nd, uh, where Council resolved that 60000 from the safe restart funds for the SBI proposal be approved for a two-year period. Um, Council also resolved that the CAO and the Mayor draft an MOU between the Town and the SBIA for the Business Development Manager proposal, with quarterly reports from the SBI to be provided to the Economic Advisory Committee. So based on uh, that resolution, the Mayor and I collaborated and drafted the MOU. We then actually worked with Councillor Wainwright, who is the Council Liaison to the ADC, as well as uh, working with the SBI Chair and Executive Director of the SBIA to finalize the actual draft. So what we hoped has been uh, developed through this process is an MOU that um, strikes a balance between ensuring a level of accountability based on realistic achievable deliverables in addition to outlining the general activities for the business development manager position uh, while also allowing sufficient flexibility and latitude to uh, achieve success in this position. It should be noted the MOU does differ from the, the actual council resolution regarding the term of the agreement. The MOU provides for a complete uh, two-year term beginning on April 1st, 2021 and ending on March 31st, 2023. So this would allow for a full two years and if it is requested by the BIA, council could consider the possibility of a further extension as part of the 2023 uh, budget deliberations. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Humble. And uh, we do have a recommendation. I'll move that the proposed draft MOU between the town and the SBIA to fund the business development manager term position be approved and the agreement be executed. Second. Uh, thank you. Any discussion? Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not in favor of the MOU in its uh, current format for a number of reasons. Um, so first of all, in, in the pitch for this position, the SBIA said they had already identified a need for this from their members, and they would be proceeding with the position whether or not council funded it. However, they suggested we should fund the position because there was significant demand from other business sectors outside the SBIA. I'm, I'm still not convinced that that's the case um, because the chamber represents a large number of Sydney businesses and is continuing to support those. And there was no evidence provided that other business sectors were asking for this support. Um, I was also concerned that this position would have the capacity to take on all Sydney businesses. Um, the SBIA board already determined that there was enough demand within their membership to justify the funding of a full-time position. Um, so it doesn't seem feasible that they would have the capacity to support the entire town. Having said that, I was still willing, willing to accept the EAC's recommendation that we try it out for one year with a review after six months to ensure that all business sectors were receiving benefit from the position. In addition, it was recognized by EAC that we would be developing an economic development strategy and we should wait until that is complete uh, to determine our next steps from the second year. Um, it's, un it's likely that there's going to be proposed actions coming from that strategy that will need to be funded. So it doesn't seem prudent or responsible uh, to commit to that second year. Um, in 
regards to the second year, when that was discussed, uh, my understanding, I believe the understanding was that we would only go into the second year a term if it was felt by council with input from the EAC that the business community was receiving benefit from this position. So what I'm concerned with the current MOU is that there's no provision for a review. Uh, there's no option for council to consider not funding the second year if we feel the program isn't meeting the expectations for council and the community. Um, another area of concern was is section uh, K, um, K uh, part D and that refers to providing more direct support to sectors such as hospitality and tourism, which have been negatively impacted by the pandemic. And while that's true, uh, the reason this clause concerns me is because one of the, the things that came up in discussions uh, with the EAC was a concern about conflict of interest and in that the SBIA already had sort of an inclination perhaps to support their members who are primarily in the hospitality and tourism sector. And so um, I'm just wondering why, why this clause needs to be in there at all. And it, it, it concerns me that, um, you know, there's an inclination we're articulating that um, they may spend more, more time on, on those issues. And I think, I guess, if the SBIA feels that their members are going to need more attention, that's fine, but that should be funded from the levy that, uh, that they already receive from those businesses. Um, the taxpayers and other business sectors shouldn't have to pay for that via the town's contribution of 60000 uh, A few other things I would have liked to see in the MOU um, in terms of financial accountability. I didn't see anything about that. Um, when I looked at the budget for the, the position, um, I think some of the amounts are, are questionable. Not that I don't think they're, you know, uh, uh, completely invalid, but I got the sense that this was something that was put together quickly. And so the SBIA made sort of a rough estimate on what they thought uh, some of these other things would cost. And so what I would have liked to see was in their reporting that there'd be a financial reporting on how the money was spent so we can get an idea uh, and evaluate whether what we uh, what was estimated is accurate or not especially if it goes into a second year um, just a couple other things data collection um, is mentioned i think that's a good thing this is needed however i think if data is going to be collected for the entire business community and potential new businesses that may be interested in investing in sydney that that information should be accessed uh, via the town's website um, i'm not sure what the plan is for that specifically but um, i'm just stating that would be my expectation and lastly i was concerned that there was in terms of collaboration there was no mention of collaboration with the Chamber of Commerce. So it mentioned SIP and some other organizations, but not the Chamber. And so that's been a concern of mine from the beginning. I know that the Chamber was not uh, uh, significantly consulted in the development of this proposal. They were notified after it was um, put together. And the Chamber is a significant player in the business community. Um, they'll be continuing to support their members. And so I have concerns about um, how that's going to play out and possible uh, duplication of efforts. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, further discussion? Uh, seeing none, uh, well, uh, Councillor Wainwright. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, um, it's that was quite a, a list of uh, of concerns about things. So I, I'm not going to revisit the uh, any of the councils already decided to approve funding for this part. Um, I, I will point out that um, the reference to SIP and BCEDA is in an example. It says such as. 
It's unfortunate they didn't say such as the chamber, but uh, because it's a such as, it's not meant to be um, an exhaustive list of, of potential partners and collaboration. It's just a such as. And if it is critical to the success of this to amend that, to include the chamber, I'd be happy to do that. Um, the reference to the provides more direct support to sectors such as hospitality and tourism, that's actually in the job description for the business development manager. Uh, it's not a deliverable in the agreement. It's just a description. It's a summary of the rationale benefits and activities of the development manager. So as I say, it's simply repeating something that's in the job description. Again, if that's going to be a significant barrier to this being approved, it's not going to make any difference if it's removed because it's in the job description. So I think the only really big point in this was that um, the, the question of the term of the agreement and there was quite a bit of discussion about that and the practicality of being able to evaluate something like this after six months. And also the issue of trying to um, retain a suitably qualified person if they're being offered essentially just a short term position. It, it makes it challenging to uh, um, you know, keep some, someone good so uh, after quite a bit of discussion about that, uh, it was felt that two years, that is a second year, was essentially necessary uh, for the evaluation of this. And, that, and that's why it goes, uh, why the draft presented uh, is a two year. Um, that's something we could have quite a bit more discussion about, but I'll stop at this point. Uh, thank you, Councillor Wainwright. I see no further speakers. I'll, um, did you, uh, well, if I might speak a first time, uh, Councillor O'Keefe, and then turn back to you. Um, just to, um, again, not to, to speak to all of the points that Councillor uh, O'Keefe had concerns with, but uh, on a couple of the points with regards to the two years um, and the point made regarding um, we also have allocated $60,000 to the pursuit of a longer term economic development strategy. Um, the fact that uh, there, there may be a two year agreement or MOU with, uh, with the BIA uh, doesn't preclude a renegotiation of that agreement uh, given the importance of the BIA to the business community within Sydney, I would think that uh, an economic development strategy is going to speak to all economic sectors, including the downtown, and that the BIA would certainly want to uh, be a part of, of, of going forward with that. And, and I think uh, a negotiation, a renegotiation, uh, or <clears throat> a change in the term would be applicable depending on what that strategy is. And depending on, we, we've allocated $60,000 to creating an economic development strategy. It doesn't say how that economic development strategy will be executed. And so that will be a separate topic for, uh, for council and, and advisory groups like the EAC once, uh, once that project uh, completes. So I don't, I don't have a concern over the two years from, from that perspective. Um, uh, to, to, I think the main point, and I think, uh, you know, amendments to this are certainly possible uh, to improve it, but um, I contrast this with do nothing. And uh, I think this was raised in, in early discussions by, by a colleague that, um, that uh, we are in the worst uh, economic crisis uh, that we've been in, in at least a generation. And I think to do nothing for the 800 business licenses in uh, Sydney, granted that the BIA would move forward with the 300 or so, 300 plus businesses that they have in the downtown. And yes, the chamber does represent some of the other businesses in Sydney but they by no means pick up the other 500 uh, uh, business licenses that are operating in, uh, in Sydney proper. Um, and so I think uh, it's, it's, it's not an option uh, during uh, the current response phase of the pandemic. We don't know whether we're going into the third wave or not yet. It's not confirmed. 
and that we know from uh, several business sectors that the recovery is certainly going to be longer than 2021-2022. Uh, um, and so I, I strongly urge uh, councillor, council members to um, to consider this and to consider amendments uh, that might uh, might lend further support to uh, to this initiative. Uh, councillor Duncan, and then I'll turn to councillor uh, councillor Duncan as a first time speaker, and then councillor O'Keefe. Thank you. Um, I I didn't really when I read the MOU have any concerns about it when councillor O'Keefe brought up the point um, K. E, uh, supporting hospitality and tourism and um, singling those ones out. I, I did have a pause as well, but I, I don't think, I don't think for the purposes of this MOU um, that matters. I believe now that the mayor has brought up, you know, the the issue of doing nothing versus doing something and getting in something and and how long the economic crisis may last. I am reminded of a Guardian article I read earlier, yesterday it came out I think, where they had a high profile health official saying that they were projecting now because of the rise of variants that even once everyone in the UK was fully vaccinated, they would not probably release masking and social distancing until 2024, because that is when the models say everyone in the developed world will also be fully vaccinated. And it's hard to know how much of the UK's public health people are, are saying is something that would be a more widespread feeling elsewhere in the world. but. If that is what we are looking at, um, this is something I think those sectors are probably going to have to really think really hard about that maybe the time of tourism with cheap fossil fuels and freedom of movement and widespread peace and security everywhere and lots of people with absolute fat stacks of cash to spend on going all over the place is it, it's going and so they're going to need a lot of help to pivot what is a huge sector sector of our economy and our employment to something else potentially. So I'm okay with that focus now. Thank you, Councillor Duncan. I'll turn to first time speaker, Councillor Rintoul. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to, um, you know, remind my, my colleagues that uh, we agreed that uh, a work group would, would come back and put together uh, an MOU. Uh, and we asked the CEO and the mayor and, and they involved Councillor Wainwright through his liaison role at the EAC. They involved the SBIA. Uh, I'm happy with what they've come up with. And I, and I don't think wordsmithing a document of, of this nature in a council meeting is something that uh, I'm going to support. Um, sure, maybe there's a few uh, nuances some of us would have preferred. Um, you know, that the chamber be referenced potentially. But as is pointed out, um, you know, that's that's likely the intent here, and I think we should expect that, that the two organizations are going to liaise. And and let's not lose sight of the fact, as the mayor alluded to, that, that, that the chamber is in the business of supporting their members. And this is uh, targeted to, to be, um, you know, a broader cross-section that's underrepresented currently. And so, yes, there's room for them to cooperate, absolutely. Um, but I think that's the intent and the spirit in which the SBA and the Chamber have been operating in, in recent years, most certainly. Uh, so, uh, you know, my uh, thought is, um, you know, we've asked a group to come back with an MOU. Uh, they've worked their way through it. Uh, I don't think this is the form to, to uh, start seeing a bunch of amendments uh, within this document. And so I'll support it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. I'll turn to Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you. So thank you to um, Councillor Wainwright for giving a, a rounding out the picture a bit better in terms of um, the stuff about hospitality and tourism mention of the Chamber. If that's sort of the general understanding, I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, my concerns continu continue to be, though, about the two years. And in regard to Councillor Rentoul's comments about referring this to a work group, um, you know, when we debated this at Council, what we had agreed to was not a, a two-year term with no uh, opportunity for review. Um, also, the, the MOU does not respond to what EAC recommended. It was our business community 
that recommended to us that we should go for a one-year term and that should be reviewed. So I, I'm totally in agreement that we need to do something. My, my colleagues will know that I've been pounding away at, at council in terms of economic uh, development initiatives for some time. So there's a definitely the need for this. But what my concern is, especially in a time when um, the uh, economic environment is uncertain, I think we need to retain our ability to be flexible, um, to, to rejig the deliverables or what we want that position to do in the second year. So I would be happy with everything if we could, we would at least have the opportunity at the first, at the end of the first year to, as we had previously agreed, to review what was being done, to get input from the EAC as to um, whether they thought this was meeting their needs. We, we've come up with a set of deliverables. Um, there's a lot of good things in there, but we don't know what future needs we might have after we've done our our strategy and so we might want to change that so all i'm hoping that we can do is if we're going to go for a two-year term to at least have the opportunity after the first year to for council to evaluate it for the eac to evaluate it and have the opportunity to um to determine if we want to move forward and or to adjust the, the deliberals to be more responsive to our business community. Uh, Councillor Wainwright, I'd, if I could comment uh, first and, and then turn to yourself. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Keefe. I'd, I'd just like to comment that um, there is provisions within the MOU for the business development manager to attend regular meetings on a regular basis. Uh, to provide, be providing update reports. EAC will be able to provide feedback uh, to that business development manager uh, at those meetings, and it is in the agreement that there will be a full report after a year to council, and council can certainly uh, make comment uh, to the BIA. Uh, uh, should we have a clause in there that the, 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 the council can, can uh, cancel the contract after one year? Uh, if it doesn't like what it what, what it sees or or after a year, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think that's appropriate. I think given the nature of this pandemic, given the nature of our the need in our business community, um, we t you talked we talked about uh, members outside the BIA. Uh, the BIA did not provide us with the exact numbers of non-members that were coming to them. They did indicate when they put this forward that they were getting. Uh, requests from non-members that they were getting something in the order magnitude of 1,200 or 14 emails a month. This is is based on demand from uh, the business community, and it's and it's an initiative to move forward. So I think there is accountability uh, in terms of reporting on a regular basis to uh, to EAC and then to council in a year. And I think we can uh, can uh, can look for ways to improve this if if that's uh, if that's important as uh, as we work through this. I'll turn to Councillor Wainwright. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'm, you've said some of the things I was going to say. So um, a key thing is that uh, there's going to be a presentation in January of 2022 on what's being done under this. So, um, you know, there will be a, a, a report at the end of the first year on, on what they've done budget-wise, successes, progress on deliverables, and all the rest. The other thing I'd say is that half of the funding is is for the position. And the position, in terms of the specifics of what they do, there is some flexibility. And they're going to be, this individual is going to be regularly attending EAC. And, you know, will um, obviously be trying to integrate whatever comes out of the ED strategy that's developed into their activities. So as, as far as the way it's written up, the specific deliverables, which is section nine, um, has uh, the core stuff that matters to us in there. And it, it provides flexibility because it's not overly prescriptive. So it talks about delivering uh, reports 
regular presentation to the EAC. That's the first thing. And specifically breaking out SBI area from the rest of Sydney. They're to enhance available online source resources through the website. So there is a clear deliverable that we expect to, we didn't say exactly what they have to do, but we expect to see improvement. They're going to utilize the business license data and create an interactive data set um, for establishes businesses in Sydney. That's a deliverable. We expect they're probably going to do something with that data, but we're not being specific about what reports and what analysis we're going to require. Um, they're going to establish and distribute a new business welcome and information package to all new businesses identified by the town. That's basically whoever takes out a license. And they're going to establish small business education regarding the need for digital infrastructure and other topics. So there's flexibility. So we've got a bunch of key deliverables, but there is scope for them to do additional stuff that will come out of the ED strategy and come out of those discussions with the EAC. So I, I think, you know, we've, I think that's pretty solid. Um, and there is a lot of opportunity to provide the direction. And in terms of um, scoping the, that flexibility, um, we're saying that they have to do it generally in accordance with the proposal they gave us. And with respect to Section K, which is the general activities of the business development manager. So I, I think there is some good accountability and opportunities for us to provide direction. And, and that's why I'm comfortable with this. Thank you, Council. Any further discussion? Uh, seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed? We have Councillor O'Keefe, uh, Councillor Fallot, and Councillor Garnett opposed. And the motion carries. Uh, thank you for the. Uh, uh, thank you, Council. I'll now turn to item 13C, a Tower Crane Rescue Services Agreement, and I'll turn to staff for uh, introduction. Introduction. Good evening, uh, Chief Mickelson. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, the purpose of the report uh, before you is to obtain Council's um, authorization to enter into an agreement with the uh, City of Victoria Fire Department for the provision of tower crane rescue services within the town of Sydney. Thank you. Any questions? I'll turn to Councillor Garnett. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Chief Mickelson. Uh, just a question as regard to, um, this, I'm assuming Saanich still dispatches out of the Vernon Road area? And does, does the Vic Fire Department dispatch out of Yates Street, or are they going to be into their new facilities, and where exactly would that be coming from? Their new uh, facilities will be, I believe, on Johnson, almost uh, identical response time to where their existing facility is at 12348. Um, when you look at it, the, the difference in, in response time, depending on like I said, a myriad of factors being traffic, could be anywhere from just one to two minutes to upwards of five minutes. Uh, but when you look at the totality of the services provided and the associated costs, uh, we feel the uh, Victoria Fire Department offers better value. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, any further questions? A motion? We have a recommendation. Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. I'll move that the Town of Sydney enter into a five-year agreement with the City of Victoria for the provision of Tower Crane Rescue Service. Second. Further discussion? Uh, Councillor Garnett. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, appreciating um, the financial aspect of it, um, I am concerned about the extra time, um, just because I know minutes matter, and uh, I, I for one, I just, I just can't put the financial aspect of it ahead of the time aspect, and it, it really is a stumbling block for me. So, I mean, even if it's one minute five, you say on your five to ten minutes, that's the, that could be the difference between somebody dying, I think, or building being done, and. For me, I, I just I can't support an agreement that puts that time factor in there for uh, just over money. I just cannot do it, so I won't support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Garnett. Seeing no further discussion, I'll call the question. All in favor? 
opposed? One opposed. The motion carries. Thank you, Chief. Uh, we'll turn to item 13D. Uh, we have a second a tree removal application for a Monterey Cypress at 7917 2nd Street. And I'll turn to staff for an introduction, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this is uh, another tree remover application. It's for a Monterey Cypress tree on 2nd. Um, this tree did uh, have limb failure during a recent snowstorm that Sydney had. Um, uh, several uh, Monterey Cypress trees in Sydney uh, had the same sort of limb failure during the snowstorm. These trees are, uh, they originated in California, so they aren't, um, you know, built to, to handle snow loads. Um, so it is uh, a risk of having these trees around. Um, but overall, uh, this tree seems to be like it's, he it's healthy. Uh, staff recommend that um, uh, up to 20% of the of the tree be pruned um, just to lighten the load on top if the homeowner wishes to do that. Um, however, if, if this tree is to be removed, it could have implications for other Monterey Cypress trees in Sydney because um, they all kind of have the same um, uh, impact from snow. Thank you, Ms. Cleary. I'll turn to questions. Uh, Councillor Fallett. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Ms. Clary. Um, I, I did a site visit on this and two things I noted is one, um, the base of the tree is absolutely humongous. That's, that's a huge tree. Um, and the other is that the property is up for sale. Um, and I believe it says development opportunity, but uh, I'm not sure, but I'm sure, I, I think that's what it said. So my question to you is, should this property be redeveloped? Um, and, and given what we recently experienced on All Bay, where there was the fencing and, uh, and we've seen it in other properties where we have the, the fencing to protect the tree and whatnot, what is the, well, you can't foresee the future, but the reality is it's going to be difficult when you get developers in there how do we protect the tree and maintain it so that we don't turn around two years after the property has been developed and then have a homeowner who says similar things to what Albay says to us? Thank you, uh, through the mayor to Councillor Fallett. Um, staff are working um, to be um, look at these things more closely in the early stages of development applications. Um, working um, more closely as a team for those to protect trees. Um, trees within building footprints um, are able to be removed. However, it, it really depends on the design of the, the building. Uh, so it, it's hard to say at this time if, if that site were to be developed, um, uh, if the tree would be impacted regardless of what we do now. Um, but staff would work to uh, protect it and protect the root zone as, as much as possible so that uh, it could be continue to live in its in its spot. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, sorry, Councillor Garnett, then Councillor O'Keefe. Sorry, um, Mr. Newcomb. Well, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If I might, I just want to add that the zoning for this site is downtown commercial C1. So it's unlikely that uh, that house would be replaced by a single family house. It'd more likely be a multi-story building that would take up most of the site. Uh, I'll turn back to, uh, to Councillor Fallett to, to follow up. Uh, thank you. So to follow up on that, Mr. Newcomb, uh, take up the, most of that site. How much of that tree is on um, road frontage and how much of that is on private property? Through the mayor, to Councillor Fallot, I actually don't know the answer to that. Yeah, uh, my memory says about seventy percent on private property, but Miss Clary might have more information. Sorry, I didn't mean to load you with that question. It's just that because you had made the comment, I just uh, spoke to it. Thank you. If I might, my the intent in making that comment was just to point out that uh, a redevelopment on that site and retaining the tree would be difficult to accomplish together. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Newcomb. Thank you. I appreciate that comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. 
Uh, Councilor Garnett. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cleary. Um, when you got, when you refer to 20% being cut, having seen the tree, I was actually there when Councilor Fallot was there on, on Friday. Uh, I'm trying to visualize what that would look like and where exactly they would be cutting. Um, through the mayor to Councillor Garnett, I am I'm not an arborist. <laughs> However, uh, that's standard um, arborist practice to cut to to remove up to twenty percent. I believe it's just trimming some of the larger limbs so that trimming them back. Um, so, uh, um, however, I'm I'm not exactly sure. I, I could uh, follow up with a, a response on that uh, after I speak with our, our the town arborist uh, tomorrow, if you would like. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Duncan and Councillor O'Keefe. Thank you. Um, I noted in the, the photos that we were provided as well, they show the power lines running through all of the branches of this tree. So I assume when they pruned it, they would be wanting to look at both the overextended limbs and I'm hoping uh, trimming around the power lines and things like that. Now, normally BC Hydro, I'm thinking, comes to, to prune trees like this. If this was on Town Boulevard, I, I'm not sure if it would be Hydro or the town who was responsible for making sure it didn't get in, get into the power lines like this. But if they need to take out more than 20% to kind of free the power lines, because that, that has to be hazard on its own, and as well as pull back the crown, um, I guess that would result in, in some injury to the tree. So I guess what I'm I'm asking is, if they go in to do this, would, would that have to be done? And is that the town of Sid Sydney who would decide how that was done or, or um, the private company or the, or the, like the, the private land, the landowner, or would it be BC Hydro that would look at that? Um, to, the to, the, to the mayor, to Councillor Duncan. So uh, BC Hydro does go around town and um, prune trees that uh, could impact power lines. They were actually just in town last week. So this tree may be more pruned than the pictures that we are looking at. I, I didn't go by uh, today to review it, um, but they, they BC Hydro is responsible for doing the pruning within a certain distance of the power line. So um, uh, an arborist approved by BC Hydro would be responsible for that. If, if BC Hydro did require um, more pruning that would result in the death of a tree. They have removed trees uh, if they they need to. BC Hydro is exempt from our, our town um, tree preservation bylaw. However, they have not approached us about this, this particular tree. They do um, approach us from time to time about certain trees that they require to remove. Um, the, the other portions of the tree could be done by a certified arborist um, by following standard uh, agricultural practices. Thank you, Councillor Duncan. And sorry, next on my list, uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you. Uh, two questions, I think. Um, first one, they mentioned on page three, um, a protected root zone calculation um, of one foot for each one inch of trunk diameter. Is that does the town also use that um, that measurement um, when we are looking at protecting trees like during construction or, or something else? Um, I'm trying to remember what it says in the, the tree bylaw. I know that they put fencing around, but is it a standard um, amount of distance that we say there has to be, you know, two meters distance? Or do we use this calculation that they quote from the, the ISA? I presume that's the Arborist Association. Thank you, Ms. Clary. Through the, the mayor to Councillor Keith. Again, I'm not an arborist, but uh, uh, the, the town's arborist does um, meet on site to help. Uh, developers determine how much where the tree fencing is supposed to be. There is a tree protection barrier um, fencing in Schedule A of our tree preservation bylaw. Um, it doesn't have the same uh, uh, calculation uh, per se. However, I know it has to do with uh, around the, the drip line of the tree. Um, and basically the tree, pre tree protection fencing needs to be approved by, our, by the town's arborist. Right. Okay. And the, the other question was, they reference um, that several times Second Street had to be closed off due to 
Brett, is is that the case? Do we know how many times that's happened? And just wanting to check in on that. Yes, uh, through the mayor again to Councillor O'Keefe. Th this this particular tree did um, cause the closure of Second Street for uh, at least a lane of it for a portion of time during that snow event. A large limb did fall on the power lines. The power lines were active, mm -hmm. and um, the the road was closed until BC Hydro had time to actually come and remove the, the limb. Um, so BC Hydro did eventually, the BC Hydro was very busy. Many trees lost many different limbs during that snowstorm. So this was one of the one of the trees they had to get to and it, it was closed for, for an amount of time because of that. Okay, thank you. That's all for me, thank you. Uh, thank you. Any further, any further questions? Uh, we have a staff recommendation. Uh, Councillor Fallett. Um, I'll make the recommendation that the application to remove the Monterey Cypress tree at 9717 Second Street be approved. Second. No further discussion? Councillor Fallot, did you wish to motivate? Uh, yes, just, just further. Um, I note that in the, uh, the discussion of the staff report, the uh, staff... Um, suggested that council should consider whether other Monterey trees in Sydney should also be removed if this tree permit was approved, removal permit was approved. Um, I, th I think there's something that differentiates this particular one with others. Um, the size of the tree, the location to the buildings around it, um, that it does need to be pruned at this point and given that there is potential, very real potential for redevelopment happening on this property, uh, probably in the near future. I'm, I'm just guessing, I don't know this. Uh, I don't see the sense in, in maintaining the tree. And so I, I feel that we would be doing the community the right decision to remove the tree even though I, I and along with the rest of my colleagues, are supportive of maintaining our trees and in, increasing our tree coverage, I get that. But this is this is a massive tree. It doesn't belong on a city lot. So um, that's that's my pitch on that one. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We had, have other speakers. Uh, I saw Councillor Intool, Councillor. Uh, O'Keefe, Councillor Wainwright, and Councillor Garnett, if we could go in that order. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I'll echo uh, support for uh, Councillor Follett's uh, comments. Um, you know, we know these uh, limbs uh, have failed, and, and quite recently, uh, we can see that the the tree limbs uh, spread out over the sidewalk and, and roadway. Um, which in itself uh, is of concern, and, and of course, these are substantial uh, limbs. We see in the report uh, from Capital Tree Service, um, you know, in their own conclusion, uh, referring to an overall uh, risk rating of of, of high, uh, and and I, I I wonder, you know, when we have access, you know, to this information um, you know, about the exposure of potential uh, liability, um, when I'm referring to the the sidewalk area and the roadway and, and the uh, fact that we've seen limbs come off this particular tree. So um, uh, like uh, my colleague, Councillor Fallot, uh, regrettably, I, I would support uh, the motion that she's put forward to approve the removal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I'll turn to Councillor uh, O'Keefe. Uh, thank you. I also s support the motion. Uh, again, what's different uh, with this uh, from other applications is that there's already been significant failure of the tree. Uh, the arborist uh, says the health and structure of the tree is rated at fair or poor. It's well into decline. Um, there's no um, mention of mitigation uh, members um, <laughs> measures that could be taken. And uh, it's in the arborist's professional opinion that there's high likelihood of failure of one or more limbs. And given the location, again, in a busy part of uh, downtown in close proximity to power lines and sidewalks where people are walking and property. I, I think it's unfortunate that it has to come down. Um, I'll also echo uh, 
Councillor Fallett's comments in regards to staff uh, perhaps seeking direction on whether we should remove all Monterey cypress trees. I mean, my feeling is that um, we will consider to all requests based on the unique circumstances. Uh, so I, I don't think that we're in a position or it's appropriate at this time to suggest that all Monterey cypress um, should be removed. I, I would see us considering them on a individual basis as, uh, as they come forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Councillor Wainwright. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'll be voting against this one. Um, you know, our staff are saying the tree is healthy and not an imminent hazard. And if uh, a development might happen at that site at some time in the future, and I'll concede it's even likely the developer can deal with removing the tree if that is an appropriate thing to do. Um, I, I'm not going to let uh, potential future development influence my thinking on this one. Uh, thank you, Councillor. I'll turn to Councillor uh, Garnet. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, some good points raised by uh, my fellow colleagues. I guess my concern, my biggest concern, and I'm loath to say this because I, it's a magnificent tree and Councillor Fallett spoke to its, its, its size and I figure how long has this been here because it's just so big and the, the limbs are so large. And what concerns me is where the limbs are and they're a little bit over the one property on the other side, but it's, it's the sidewalk and the street that worries me the most. And, um, you know, we could prune back those branches, I guess, but I'm just wondering what kind of damage that would cause to the tree. And it, has, it is recommended or mentioned in the report that uh, cutting back too much will, will eventually cause the death of the tree. And I think to make that area safe for residents, we'd have to cut a significant portion of those branches or limbs off the side so that the street and the, and the sidewalk are not impacted for, for people just walking or driving their car through there. And unfortunately, it's just another example of development overtaking nature. For lack of a better way of putting it, the tree was probably there first and we've built houses around it and this is where we are. But it, it, I'm, I'm torn on this one, to be honest with you. I, 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 wanna, I wanna support as many trees as possible in our community, but at the same time, this one, to me, poses a significant amount of risk for, for, for residents uh, traversing in through that area. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Garnett. Um, I'll speak for just a moment and, and I'm um, going to oppose this motion. I, um, I certainly appreciate the comments from Council, but again, I don't want to, um, I won't be swayed by the potential for future development as, as Council Wainwright has, has drawn attention to. Um, I think that can be dealt with in the, in the time frame that that, that arises. Um, and I think that um, the recommendation that, uh, that pruning can be done uh, arborists are professionals and, and they'll make a professional assessment as to uh, the appropriate 20% uh, to be pruned and um, and uh, it's a substantial tree and benefit to the community and, and uh, not an imminent hazard so I, I do support the, uh, the staff recommendation at this time. Seeing no further speakers, I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Uh, there are three opposed, Councillor Wainwright, Councillor Duncan, and myself. The motion carries. Thank you, Council. And thank you, staff. And um, we'll now turn to correspondence. And we do have the um, uh, letter from uh, Mr. John Blair under correspondence. We have spoken to uh, his input uh, on the matter earlier on the agenda, and we do have a motion. Move receipt. Second. All in favor? Uh, motion carries. Thank you. And uh, we have no new business. Uh, we have uh, two items to receive and a correspondence for information. Move receive. Second. All in favor? Uh, motion carries. Thank you. And uh, we do have a motion to go on camera. I'll move that it is in the opinion of council that the public interest requires that persons other than members of council and officers be excluded from the meeting to consider a confidential matter relating to a legal issue pursuant to section 90.1 G of the community charter and that council continue the meeting in closed session. Second. Uh, all in favor? Uh, the motion carries and a motion to adjourn, please. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded, all in favor? Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks for, so, for those attending the meeting, and uh, we will adjourn for uh, five minutes to reconvene in, in camera.